Sabbath, and so I'm so glad that we um, are here today to, to explore what on earth Jesus was talking about in this great text. As we begin, I ask us all to be in an attitude of prayer. The Lord, may the words of my mouth and Vincent's mouth that share the words that came from your mouth. And the meditations of all of our hearts in this place this day be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I've been preparing for this sermon, I've been thinking a lot about my own childhood. And, and uh, I want you to think about your childhood and think about... Um, Think about when you were a lot younger than you are today, okay? And think about the things that, that brought you pleasure, the things you had fun doing, the, the, the games you played, the, the things that just, um, uh, the wonder of the world. And, and I, I thought about when I was a kid growing up here in Dallas, uh, we grew up in, in, until fourth grade in Richardson, and my street in the summertime, it was that, you know, concrete, but they used to fill the cracks in the concrete with, with tar. Does anybody remember that? And when it was a hot summer like it was this summer, the tar would start to bubble. Oh, my gosh, we'd love to go out in the street. And You know, how dangerous is that? We'd love to go out in the street and pop all the bubbles in the tar. That was one of my favorite things to do in the summertime. Shows you what, how excited I was as a kid. But anyway, it was fun. And then, and then we had relatives who lived in South Dakota, Webster, South Dakota, and they had a farm. And we loved to go up there and, and visit the relatives because they grew corn on their farm. And whenever we would go, we loved to play hide-and-seek in the cornfield. And, and just, I mean, what a perfect place to get lost. I heard today, or this past week, somebody was in a corn maze and, and got panicked because they couldn't get out, and they called the police and said, get, get us out. So, and so I understand that feeling. From, my, from a child's eye view, in a cornfield, you can't see too much. Oh, it was so much fun as a kid. When we, when we think about the world from our child's what we remember our child's perspective. I mean, we, we remember uh, a lot of things, and, and we remember what it, it meant to be um, a child. And, and for many children, those memories are very beautiful and, and are very, um, they, they feel safe and protected and cared for. I mean, those are our memories of, of childhood. Um, memories that that we go back to and that we feel that warmth of embrace. Now, we know that not all children have those memories when they think back to life from their child's view. And that's and and, and we and we we'll talk about that today. In fact, both of those perspectives are what Jesus was getting at in today's scripture that Vincent read so well. Thank you. Um, it's an interesting text today because Jesus was walking along and um, his disciples asked him the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, at first hearing, um, for those of us who are adults, that may not be as childish as it came across perhaps to Jesus' ears and perhaps if we think about it a little bit more. And in fact, it's it gets even more childish when you read the same text asked by the disciples in the Gospel of Luke when they were in the midst of an argument between themselves. And the question really came out in, in Luke, which of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which of us are going to get to sit on the right hand of God or your right hand, Jesus? And, and it's this whole question the disciples were, were arguing about um, who's the best of us? Who's the king of the hill? Childish question. Now, in Matthew, it comes across not so much um, as uh, 
uh, jostling for power amongst the disciples. It might have really been a theological question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They asked. It might be kind of like asking the question that Time Magazine asks every year. Uh, Who's going to be Time Magazine's man of the year? Or People Magazine's, who's going to be the sexiest man alive? Or MSNBC or CNN and Fox News Now, which presidential candidate is the best for our country in 2012? All of those questions that are out there now. What Jesus, how Jesus answered. He, he brought a kid over and had the kid stand beside him and, and said, unless you turn and become like a child, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless you turn, unless you change, unless you start moving away from these kind of questions that worry about social status and social hierarchy in heaven, and become like a child, and become not childish, I don't believe Jesus was saying, but instead you become childlike, then, and only then, will you be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven, and this is one of my favorite texts, um, to think about the kingdom of heaven as the place where God welcomes ones such as these, that they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I love this text. It's been such a comfort for me to be able to use it in those very difficult times when I've had to journey with families who have lost babies, who have lost their children before they've really had a chance to live their lives. What a great image of heaven this gives us that in God's realm, our children are those who are welcomed as the most important, as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But it goes on even more than that. It, um, Jesus talks about how, how the disciples, in order to get to that point, must be humbled like a child, must get to a place where they see the world and see themselves like a child. Now, when you hear that text, what does it mean for you? What do you think Jesus was trying to get us to to think about and to do to see like a child? What is he wanting us, and how is he wanting us to see? A child is trusting and is looking for guidance, needs guidance. And Jesus is saying, unless you become like one of these children and trust and and become dependent upon God, your father, your, your mother, your parent, then you're not gonna get there. Right, what else, how else? is Jesus calling us? How, what else do children see from their child perspective that Jesus might be calling us back to? Right. That's right. Jesus is calling us to see the world again. And, and I think Jesus is calling us to be naive. Not in the sense that we understand it now, which is blinded by um, um, rose-colored glasses or, or in denial. I don't think Jesus is calling us to be that way. But in the root word of the word, the Latin, for naive is to be born, to be born, innocent, bo- uh, fresh. So Jesus is calling us to see again freshly, innocently, the the world. Now what happens, those of us who are uh, a little older, and that's all of us, because, you know, even Vincent, who's the youngest one here, he's seen the world, he's seen, he's watched TV. What happens as we grow up? What happens as we age to that, that innocence, that naivete? You, you become, you, your, your eye, your eye view 
becomes negative, unless you have a good therapist. But, uh, but even then, I think we, we struggle with our cynicism. And we begin to, to see the world not as this place of wonder that our children see, but instead we, we begin to see it as a place of suspicion, of danger, of fear. And when we lose our child's eye view of the world, sometimes I think we lose our vision to the children that are in our midst. When we become cynical and see the world with a loss of innocence, sometimes we lose sight of the innocence of the kids in our midst. And we see that happening over and over again. Jesus saw that happening in his time. You heard, you heard Vincent share the next piece of the scripture when Jesus said, any of you who receive a child in my name, yours will be the kingdom of heaven, but woe to you if one of you causes this child to stumble, if one of you causes this child or place, places an obstacle in front of this child, woe to you, it would be better and I mean, you can hear Jesus' tone of voice in this scripture. It would be better for you if you tied a millstone around your neck and threw yourself into the water and drowned. Now that's pretty harsh for Jesus, isn't it? That's not the kind of word that we hear from Jesus usually. But my goodness, this is how seriously Jesus takes how we care for children and how we take care of ourselves as children of God to help protect our children and create the realm of God on earth for them. And if Jesus were here right now, he might not be happy with what he sees. He might be shaking his head. I mean, just watch the news. Uh, just again, in the last couple weeks, you know, we just get over the Casey Anthony trial, right? And that cute little Kaylee Anthony who was murdered, uh, they thought by her mother, but she got off. Who knows what happened to that little girl? And now another child has been kidnapped and is missing. We, we see um, when you go shopping, as I do for my little uh, nieces, and you look for little outfits for them, Julie, you know this. I mean, you don't have kids that age anymore. But when you go shopping, and the little outfits make them look like they're 10, 20 years older than what they should look like, right? And they don't know the meanings of the kind of outfits that they're wearing. They don't understand it. And yet we're still marketing to kids, little girls, before their sexuality is really understood by them. The Children's Defense Fund, um, who puts on Children's Sabbath every year, gives a list of things um, that we may try to forget, or we may be in denial, or we may um, want to, to be blinded to. Statistics about every day in America. Every day in America, five children, every day in America, five children are killed by abuse or neglect, Five children or teens commit suicide. Eight children or teens are killed by firearms. Eighty babies die before their first birthdays. 186 are arrested for violent offenses. 368 children are arrested for drug offenses. 949 babies are born every day with low birth weight, which means that their mothers did not take care of them while they were pregnant. 2,058 children are confirmed as abused or, or neglected. 2,163 babies are born without health, insu health insurance. 2,573 2 babies are born into poverty. And every day in America, 3,312 high school students drop out of school. I mean, those are horrible statistics. Wouldn't Jesus just be shaking his head? And shouldn't we, as followers of Christ, shake our head that this is the way we're treating and working with our children? The prophet Jeremiah once said, shout it out, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is crying for her children. She refuses to be comforted because they are not comforted. 
I mean, we should be crying out ourselves. A voice is heard in Dallas, lamentation and bitter weeping. Dallas is weeping for our children, and we refuse to be comforted until our children are comforted. This is what happens when we grow into adulthood and we give in to cynicism and we don't see like a child or through the eyes of our children and and grandchildren. And so we allow the world to become a place where they aren't safe and protected and cherished as the treasures they are. Well, I give thanks that that Jeremiah did not just leave us there, because that's pretty dire. Um, Jeremiah continues in that scripture this way. God says, stop your crying, wipe your tears. All that I've done for your children, all that you've done and will do for your children will not go unrewarded, because they will return from the enemy's land. There is hope for your future. Your children will be safe. Thus says the Lord. Jeremiah 31. You can find it there. Wonderful text, both that challenges us, but also guides us into hope. And so what we're called by Jesus to do, the the continued stretching exercises, and and we talked about last week that that, um, just because we were ending the stretching exercises of the Bible sermon series, that we would probably be finding texts in our scriptures as we go through that continue to stretch us and challenge us. The challenging word of the text from Jesus today is, how are each one of us as disciples of Christ going to see again as children? How do we see our children? And what are we doing about it? How do we respond to make sure that we are not a part of the stumbling block, the obstacle in our society? Well, let me tell you a couple of things that I I think we um, do well. In this church, we've taken commitment to children. I think think this is one of the congregate, the the most um, dedicated congregations for caring for children. During the week, if you come up here, we have about 80 kids, right, Jamie, more or less? 80 kids in the school across the hall from where we're worshiping right now, um, down on this level, in the Head Start program, um, helping to give space for kids to come to learn who are designated by our culture as being those in poverty and not given a good head start in life already? Well, the Head Start program is here to help them get a head start. 80 kids, and we have it here. On this side of the building, in this room back there, back behind the black curtains, is where we have about 40 of our kids, uh, parents who are here going to the English language ministry, and the kids are too young to be in school yet, and they come to the preschool program here. And, and let me just tell you about some of those parents. Most of them are mothers, but we have like three husbands and wives, couples who are coming now together to English language ministry. And the way that they, and the reason why they're here uh, together is they want to learn how to speak the language of this nation so that they can go talk to doctors if their kids are sick, so that they can go to school and talk to teachers and, and help their kids with their homework. And this is an area where we have, I can't, I don't know, how many tutors do we have in the English, from East Dallas? Uh Uh-huh. So seven, there there are seven of us who are here helping in this program. And there are a lot more places where we need tutors. We have a a waiting list of 150 students because we don't have enough volunteers. So there's opportunity to help. Um, We just got done with Pandemania. And wasn't that just the best fun in the whole world? And Julie Alexander, I'm so glad she's able to be here today on Children's Sabbath in particular because of anybody, Julie is our poster child 
for this text and how to be committed to children. Because you've been doing this ministry here voluntarily for years. And we give, we give thanks. Now, I'm not doing that just to lift you up totally. Well, then. Then, yes, I am doing it. Happy birthday, Julie. All right, remember that, and we'll sing happy birthday to Julie later. That's great. Um, but, but I still think that, that and we had a wonderful group, and, and the kids in this church know that, that they can come to Sunday school and that they are beloved in their Sunday school classes. They love Miss Bobette and Miss Carolyn and Miss Misty. You know, they love going to Sunday school and seeing their teachers. And, and in this church, we had a church chums program where adults in the church just loved on, had a kid that they kind of adopted as their church chum. And, and we need to reinstate that again, I think, because we have a lot more kids being born into this church now. Soon to be Odin James back there. Woohoo! So, so, but I'm going to speak on behalf of you if that's all right. It's hard. One of the hardest places to get volunteers in this church is for teaching children Sunday school. Or, on behalf of Micah, being a youth sponsor or a youth Sunday school class teacher. And, and this is the most important ministry, I think, that we do in this church, is take care of the children that Jesus called us to become like. So, that's a little commercial break there. And I, but I feel very committed to this ministry because I do think that in this world that, from which these statistics just jump out and scream, we have become stumbling blocks that the followers of Jesus Christ need to respond by doing what we can for kids. So, I'm just going to plant that seed for you. And, and some of us here think, well, because uh, I get into this mode being now of a certain age almost, I think, well, you know, I kind of did that. I was a youth minister for a while. I was a youth sponsor for a lot longer than that. And, and, and you know, I taught school. I took care of the kids in, back then. And, you know, um, and I was a, a JYF sponsor, you know, for a while too. So I've kind of done my duty. I'm done. And I think some of us get into that mode, but guess what? <laughs> we can't never be done. None of us can ever be done finding ways to care for our children. So I invite us now to hear Jesus' call to become like children, to not childish. I mean, we become that often enough, but to become childlike and see the world with childlike eyes. In closing, I want to read this poem by M Mary Rita Corzin, and she wrote this to her mother. But I think this is something that we all need to think about for our own lives. When you thought I wasn't looking, you hung my first painting on the refrigerator and I wanted to paint another. When I, you thought I wasn't looking, you fed a stray cat, and I thought it was good to be kind to animals and to others that no one cared about. When you thought I wasn't looking, you baked a birthday cake just for me, and I knew that little things like me were special. When you thought I wasn't looking, you say to said a prayer over my bed at night, and I believed that there was a God that I could talk to, too. When you thought I wasn't looking, you kissed me goodnight, and I knew I was loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, and it was okay to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, you smiled, and it made me want to look that pretty, too. When, I, when you thought I wasn't looking, you cared, and I wanted to be everything that you told me I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked. And I want to say thanks for all the things you did. 
when you thought I wasn't helpful. May God bless us as we continue to look at the world through the eyes of a child and to become like a child. Because guess what? We are all children of God. Let's give thanks. Almighty One, we ask this day that that you continue to remind us to open our eyes to the world, to see the world from a child's perspective, to, to see <laughs> to see the wonders of it all, the abundance of beauty and places that bring us joy, and also, Lord, help us to 